Greetings everyone, my name is Professor Stefano Gualeni and this is a telescope for the mind. Um, the title of this talk is not originally mine. In fact, it comes from Margaret Masterman, who is a British linguist who used it as the title of one of her 1962 um, article on the Times Literary Supplement. In that article, titled A Telescope for the Mind, she compared the potential of computers to transform our conception of the world to the invention of the telescope in the 17th century. Galileo's invention in that period not only advanced and spurred more scientific research and new knowledge in fields such as optics or geography or astronomy, um, but also it was momentous in terms of changing the minds of the people of the period, for example, concerning the centrality of planet Earth in the universe or the role of religion in social life. Similarly, I'm going to discuss the computer as again a telescope something that can be used and of course it led to uh, great advancements in a number of fields including scientific ones or the automa or automation of tasks but also as an instrument a technological device that led to profound changes in the humanities the human sciences in the ways that we understand and portray uh, ourselves and relate to one another so I'm going to focus in particular in that telescopic function of computer in its possibility to disclose the interactive, the interactive experience of virtual worlds. When I talk about virtual worlds or virtual technologies, I'm not uniquely referring to virtual reality, but more broadly to a variety of technologies that disclose what we mean or what we normally call worlds. By that, I mean that whenever something is persistently perceivable, non-actual and interactable with in a way that is meaningful, that according to a uh, philosophical current called phenomenology, that sets up an experiential world. And it doesn't quite matter whether it's experienced on a screen, through a visor, whether it's playful or serious, whether it's in first person or third person. All of those are indifferently understood as virtual worlds of different kinds. And about me, who am I to talk to you about these things? My name is Stefano, um, I have a PhD in philosophy, I was a game designer and I deal with um, game studies and game design at the University of Malta at the Institute of Digital Games. Um, just a few notes about myself. As I said, I used to be a game designer in the industry. I've worked there for about 12 to 15 years, depending on when, how we calculate it. I released about 12 commercial titles. And then, as some friends of mine would say, I wasted it all to get a PhD in philosophy and start an academic career. Only I don't see it that way. Uh, to me, the creation and the study of virtual world is really crucial to philosophy, at least to nowadays philosophy. Um, through the creation and the analysis of virtual worlds, we can, in a way, redigest uh, our philosophical past, apply and uh, reshape new and old notions, and give rise perhaps to new perspectives and maybe better questions that um, are only and they are uniquely possible to be asked and maybe to be answered through the digital medium. So to me, what is happening now with computation is particularly interesting from a philosophical point of view, okay? Should you be interested in furthering these ideas in particular, there are two books, two monographic uh, volumes that are published. Um, you can see them on screen right now, which in a way condense and further develop knowledge that was generated in fields such as game studies, virtual uh, worlds research, philosophy of, te of technology, and so on and so forth. So if you want to go deeper into these topics, these two books should be exactly what you're looking for. But let's get started. So how do we look at the experience of virtual worlds and virtual worlds as technical artifacts 
as in a way portals, gateways to disclose the experience of virtual worlds and what effects do they bring about. Um, since you are listening to this video and you're probably participating to a webinar somewhere, um, I suppose that you're already kind of in a way convinced that digital technology has a positive and potentially um, very fruitful impact in education. What you should know already or should already have an inkling about is that virtual worlds are transformative in many ways, many more than I'm going to be discussing today. For example, if you're into education or serious gaming, you already, I'm sure, treat um, computer games or virtual worlds or interactive simulations as capable of communicating notion and teaching certain preferred procedures in fields like education and training, very institutional fields. Take, for example, uh, the following. Video games and digital simulations can be used, for example, to simulate delicate surgery, um, surgical procedure or medical operations without putting the patient's life at risk, especially when um, you as a user are in training for these kind of things. Similarly, we can talk about uh, flying simulator, uh, which can put the pilot in particularly dangerous or risky conditions that well, um, they're better experienced in simulation, as simulations first before um, them being encountered in the actual world. Uh, both these procedures will help, of course, limit the damage and still produce uh, relevant knowledge for the trainee in question. Um, in class, games are used to stimulate questions or to impart notions concerning history, historical figures, architecture, um, uh, archaeology and so on and so forth. I mean, I could mention several examples, but this is precisely not the topic of this talk. So this is something that you perhaps should already know about since it's been the case in 15 years and many European events and grants and um, well, forms of investment, both cultural and financial, rotate around the persuasive and instructive possibilities of uh, interactive worlds. So what am I going to talk about instead? So beyond their use already institutionalized in education and training, virtual worlds can be used to challenge dominant cultural discourse and promote critical thinking. What I mean is that they can reveal other forms of being, different perspectives, it can, they can put into question our, in a way, established assumptions and beliefs about something. So they can put into question the knowledge that we already have or we already think we have. A particularly good example of um, these kind of games or these kind of virtual worlds is offered by Card Life by Richard Hofmeyer. In this game, uh, the designer presents the player not with a power fantasy, not with a problem that eventually can be solved if resources and actions are optimized to a certain degree, but rather to the repetitive, tedious, and occasionally, if not ever, hopeless um, role of an immigrant or an otherwise disenfranchised, disenfranchised person who needs to make a living in the United States, often without a social security uh, support, kind of. So is this game fun? Well, no, not particularly, precisely because it challenges the notion of what a game traditionally is in terms of the expectations that the players have when facing a game. And at the same time, it proposes a critical view of um, how invisible and how poorly discussed and how poorly catered for uh, disenfranchised and marginalized people are in the American society, within the American society, of course. Another great example of similar games are The Parable of the Polygons by Nikki Case. Um, in this game, she reveals how, um, by a financial and statistical means, these um, events, and, by, and I'm talking about segregation and gentrification of urban areas, uh, come to be. And those kind of things are in a way taught and communicated to the players, not by means of traditional media, such as I don't know, video or text, something that is also used in education, but rather through playful interaction and internalizing interactive information.
it's quite a great thing and it indeed changes your mind uh, with regard to how you think about social disparity and homogenization of social groups. Another great and famous game in this regard when it comes to politics and propaganda is the McDonald's video game by Moll Industria. Um, the game puts the player in the role of a manager of uh, the McDonald's corporation and the implicit goal of the game is that of keeping the corporation going, keeping it in business. Uh, the player will quickly realize that in order to do so, many questionable activities will need to be uh, accepted and done, including um, lowering the wages of your uh, low level staff or deforesting the Amazon to make room for soy plantation and so on and so forth, serving sick cows even when that should not be allowed and so on and so forth. So if you are interested, you, whoever uh, is watching this webinar uh, lecture or your student in understanding political rhetorics in video games and how interaction might be set up for you to fail and to take the, let's say, the evil side of the discussion, um, this is a great example that I uh, recommend you to check. Um, so in a way, the negativity of the whole functioning and the need to stay alive is part of the rhetorical message um, proposed by the designers in this particular game. And of course, I do not mean to use rhetoric or rhetorical in a pejorative sense. What I mean to say is that the developers, Molle Industria, certainly used interaction and in-game possibilities to inherently and uh, experientially uh, reveal a certain point of view, which is normally critical of what has been done until now, or I mean pointing the uh, attention of the player onto aspects of our society and our politics that are not necessarily inclusive, fair, uh, viable, or uh, ideologically sound. Ian Bogus called these kind of games uh, persuasive games and the mechanics, the logics underneath it, uh, uh, procedural rhetorics. But let's go back to our point. Virtual worlds can be transformative in many ways, as we've seen. They can be institutionally uh, used as tools for education and training. They can be used as countercultural, uh, expressive, usually related to artistic movements tools to promote critical thinking or to criticize certain socio-political decisions or attitudes. And finally, they can be used as tools for thinking. They can disclose experiences and interactions to think with. They are, in other words, or they have, rather, the possibility to be treated as interactive thought experiments. But before I give you some examples of how digital worlds can be used as, in a way, tools for thinking with, I'm, I might mention that there's another little possible use of um, virtual technology and video games, which is to perceive things otherwise, to go beyond human perception. This is also a bit of a uh, thought experiment, but I'm not going to go too deep into it. But for example, if you ever wondered what happens to time and space and geometry, if you as an active, let's say, entity in the universe approach the speed of light, there's a game that allows you to, in a way, experientially familiarize with, the, with this kind of relativistic uh, changes to our experience that could happen. So instead of necessarily being a physics uh, major and the capability, and instead of having the capability to calculate those kind of modification and transformations yourself, there's a game-like experiment that allows players to progressively slow down the time of light and approaching experiencing the world as almost as a photon. What does it mean? What would it mean for me to turn back? Why does geometry all skew and life is weird and yeah, it's a very interesting, in a way, thought experiment, but again, has to do with perception rather than thinking. Another example I worked on is a game called Harvest, which tries to put the players into a situation where they have desires and perceptions that are similar to those of a bat. 
so the game could be like a um, thought experiment about what it is like to be a bat in response to the very famous question by Thomas Nagel. He's a philosopher that famously inquired about whether we could ever understand what it is like to be for a bat to be a bat. A puzzle platformer game called Migakure by Mark Ten Bosch asks the player to start reasoning in four spatial dimensions instead of three. So at that point, we would need to, to be successful and to be able to play this game correctly, we would need to be able to reason in five uh, dimensions, right? So four spatial ones plus time, as opposed to the four one that we traditionally live by. In a way, pushing our brain to think in and perceive the world and geometry and space in ways that are different from um, how we perceive it as biological creatures in our everyday relationship with the actual world. And I could even talk about the work of my friend Alan Hook, who uses computers and computation and cameras and virtual reality to provide the, um, let's call it the player, for lack of a better term, uh, the experience of what animals feel like from a perceptual point of view. So to get closer to them by mimicking very closely their point of view, the way they see light, color, uh, the way they perceive smells and hearing and so on and so forth. But this is not where I'm going at. I'm going to talk more specifically about thought experiment from a conceptual point of view. So thought experiments in philosophy are tools that we use to think with. And they normally um, are used to stimulate intuition and reveal ambiguities and contradiction in the way we believe something, we justify our beliefs, we articulate our thought and orient our moral compass. There are indeed many thought experiments that are about the morality of something. Um, you might have heard about that more recently than not with the idea of self-driving cars, right, and about the hypothetical scenarios that are created for the player or the user or the future user to um, make decisions about what the car that they want to drive should behave like in terms of a certain ethical scenario. The one I'm talking about now was designed by myself, and it's called Something Something Soup Something, and in a way it replicates a thought experiment by this uh, Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. In a way, the game takes place in the future, in a futuristic kitchen. Only the kitchen is no longer in use. Why? Because humanity invented teleportation, which is that kind of teal looking machine on the back of the picture. So the kitchen is no longer in use, but we use teleportation to, instead of liberating humanity by oppressing aliens. In fact, it turns out it's way cheaper to build food um, on an alien planet and then have it teleported, teleported to Earth rather than producing food directly on our planet. Um, the problem arises though when we figure out that aliens don't have a clear idea of what food looks like for us. In particular, in this game, we are ordering soup in a soup kitchen, meaning that we're asking aliens to produce soups, but they don't have a clear idea of what they look like. So in the game, we take the role of a server who needs to decide whether what they produced, these aliens, are uh, actual soups that can be served to humans. And during play, um, the player is exposed to a number of different soups and possibilities with different kind of cutlery, containers, ingredients, thickness, uh, and so on and so forth. And the player can decide by pushing left or right whether that would be a viable soup or that should be discarded. This is what a discarding of a soup looks like. In this case, a soup was served in a coconut um, and it was frozen with rice and carrots. So one of the questions that the game implicitly asks is, does it need to be a liquid? And what can it contain? What can it be served with? The game proposes like many, many soups, uh, about 20 per play session, um, evaluating different categories of thinking. So the player, in a way, by picking soups to be served or not, are revealing their beliefs about soups. 
and soups can be very weird. Yeah. At the end of the experience, the game gives back a reasoned um, definition of what soup could be based on the decisions made within the game. So not only it questions their player's understanding of what a soup is during gameplay, but also confronts them with a final like synthesis of their own decision. Can the game be won? Well, um, no, because the, what it does is like challenge you and then in a way like spit back to the player, you, um, whatever you put into the game in terms of decisions. Um, the game is freely available on a website, which you can reach from the previous one, the one I told you at the beginning of the, of the talk. But it is interesting that the website, and I do the same thing with all my little game and thought experiments and so on and so forth, um, come with a bunch of publications and video and explanations. So what I'm trying to get at is that if we decide to use video games and virtual worlds as tools for the humanities, for thinking through, for debunking ideologies and so on and so forth, it does not mean that we understand them as in a way exclusive new tools or the f fabulous panacea of all the problems in the human sciences. Rather, it's a new way of expressing that allows for certain particular things to work much better than text and other things much worse than text. What I'm trying to say here is that it is an addition to an arsenal for thinking and expressing and not the final ultimate answer to what philosophy needed to do. This non-exclusivity of the digital medium is also explored in another paper of mine, but that's not super important. The important thing is that you get the message and the message is it's a great powerful tool. It's like a telescope for the mind. It doesn't need it doesn't mean that the telescope is all you're going to ever be using. There's going to be still other tools that you use to explore the cosmos and yourselves and the situations you're in and the ethics you, you live by. So more papers and games of this kind you can find in, uh, well, actually on my website, if you click either paper or games, there's tags on top of that. And uh, well, I hope that I managed to convince you that we could use, we can, and actually we already are largely using uh, virtual worlds as social tools, even when we do not know it. So since they're gonna influence the way in which we think, we operate in schools and we communicate and express ourselves, my point here is that we should try to get or develop awareness and knowledge about how they operate and what the possibilities are and what virtual worlds and simulation are particularly good at and what they're particularly not good at and should be not used in certain other fields. So what I'm trying to say is like, since they're already a uh, important and constitutive aspect of how we develop culture, self-knowledge and relationships with others, we might as well invest in studying what they do from a number of different perspectives. So those two, those two aspects in blue were to me the central ones to this talk because they're hardly ever discussed outside of academia. And I think you should become aware that this is a thing. And again, in case you want to delve more and deeper into these topics, let me recommend you these two books, which were written precisely with that scope. That said, I thank you. And if you want to follow my academic adventures, um, you can use Twitter. Thank you very much. And I hope this was clear and helpful. Bye bye.